Hey friendo, Steve here. Welcome back to Wrestle Juice. It's time to look at your hot takes. Make sure you're subbed to the channel and you have the little notify bell turned on because every week I drop one of these hot takes community thread things. And then if you want to get yours in the show or at least have a chance to do it, then that's a great way to do it because then you always know when the thread is going up. Let's go ahead and hop right into it. First up, Gorilla Mon 541 says, Braun Breaker needs to squash Sammy for the Intercontinental title at Money in the Bank. It'd be great for establishing Braun, and I don't think I can handle yet another Sammy underdog victory in 2024, even though I'm a massive fan. I, it doesn't sound like you're a massive fan by saying you want him to get squashed. But I, I take your point, you think it'd be good for the story. Sammy does not need a long title reign. On that, I will agree with you. Sammy is better at the chase. And at this point, he's like, hey, I did it. I accomplished my goals. I kind of feel like Sammy at some point should lose that Intercontinental Championship. Probably at SummerSlam, maybe a little bit, maybe no, not much later than that certainly by the end of the year, because at a certain point, Sami Zayn's going to want to go after that world title, or he should, as a character, want to go after the world title. And granted, it's a super clustered up scene right now, but I think Sami going after the world title would be kind of awesome because it's the one thing that he's never got. He's challenged for it multiple times, but he's been the Intercontinental Champion before. He's been a tag champion before. And the next step up after... Having been in WWE for quite a long time is the world title. Should Braun squash him? I don't know that's the way to go. I feel like if we're going to get squash matches these days, um, it, you know, besides this whole jobber thing, uh, it's going to be like storyline based. Like Liv Morgan will drug Damian Priest before a world title match and he'll go out there and then he'll get annihilated. I don't think that's going to happen. But, you know, Triple H, everything's got to have a motiv motivation behind it. And if Sami Zayn just sort of gets caught off guard by Braun Breaker, like, okay, but when the rematch happens, it'll be like a proper match and Sami should win. I mean, the guy basically went, you know, toe-to-toe uh, -to -toe with Roman Reigns at Elimination Chamber a year ago and, and came this close to winning. So, I mean, he's been, it, the idea is Sami Zayn can beat anybody, so I don't know that a straight up squash would really make much sense. And I feel like they're already doing a really great job sort of establishing Braun Breaker as this killer type guy. I do think that under this current regime, though, I could see them taking Braun Breaker too. Like he's going to lose this match to Sammy through no fault of his own, I feel. They're going to do some sort of distraction situation. Braun Breaker's racked up a lot of enemies in a short period of time. He's got Sheamus, Ilya... Ricochet, Ludwig Kaiser, that's going to bite him in the ass. And I think that's one of Braun Breaker's stories going to be, how do I make sure not to piss off everybody? Because eventually that's going to, that's going to, that's going to bite me in the ass. So I don't know. We'll see. Stu Wallbomb5040 says the finish of Austin Rock at Mania 17 is one of the worst finishes in WWE history. Yeah, I agree with that. I, oh my God, I can't tell you. I remember I was at, uh, I don't remember where I was at. I think I was at Yankee Doodles in the San Fernando Valley because they used to have WWE pay-per-views. I remember I watched Rock Hogan there, but I think one year earlier I did watch uh, uh, Rock Austin there at WrestleMania 17. I think that's I think that's the case. And I remember watching wherever I was, I watched it, and that finish absolutely inferior. It was a great match. But I was like, why the fuck is he kept shaking hands with Vince McMahon? That'd be kind of fun to do like either like a tier rank or like a top 10 thing, like the worst finishes in WWE history. Because there, here's the thing, there's been some really bad ones. I mean, a lot of people say, and I'm not necessarily one of them, but a lot of people say uh, Fiend versus Seth Rollins in 2019 might be the worst finish of all time. Uh, there is a lot. I'll be honest, there was a lot in that like 2017 to 2019 time period with just all, and usually they involved a uh, Brock Lesnar, a uh, Roman Reigns, uh, maybe even a Fiend with the, the Goldberg stuff. Uh, and then like, yeah, because there's like the money in the, like Braun cashing in money in the bank at Hell in a Cell and that, that going nowhere. There's been a lot of Undertaker versus Goldberg. I don't even remember what the finish of that was, but it was probably terrible. Uh, yeah, there's been a lot of really bad finishes and that was just in that one, like two year span right there. 
But the S17, that was a pretty that was a pretty terrible one. The reason I'm pointing over here is because this is where I got all the questions over here. Claus Techno says Dragonov and Braun Breaker proved to be more worth for WWE than signing Okada and Osprey. Well, we'll never know, will we? Because they didn't sign him. And this is like an alternate universe type question. I don't know. I'll, so, like, if you want to break it down, I do think that Will Ospreay is probably... I, I believe the stories that WWE quite didn't understand just how good he would be, like, on the mic. Maybe they saw him as another Ricochet type, although if they were paying any attention, you'd know that his promos in New Japan are pretty damn good. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. I mean, look, it's it's they're very they're all very different... Things like Ilya's been in WWE's system now for for years, uh, and he's just he's he is one of the best wrestlers they got. The guy's absolutely terrific. He's got a really high ceiling. Braun Breaker uh, obviously has come a long way since 2021 when he started uh, there at NXT 2.0. And I, the thing about Okada is WWE lately, especially under Triple H, uh, hell under Vince McMahon, like every, uh, under all the regimes there in WWE. They haven't done a great job with wrestlers who don't speak English as their native language, as their primary language. I think Okada is in a perfect spot in AEW. I really do. I like what they're doing with him there. And it's all sort of based on him kind of like being close with the elite coming into the company and already having ties to AEW because of the New Japan Forbidden Door stuff. And so it works really well. He fits right in. And the fact that they made him a bad guy who says bitch a lot, I still find it amusing. I think it's still I think it's still good because I know whenever he's going to lace up his boots, we're going to get a really, really good match with Kazuchika Okada. If he were in WWE, obviously the presentation would be a lot different. I've seen some takes that he would just end up like Shinsuke, but I think Shinsuke is a different story. Triple H wanted to push Shinsuke in a major way, and he did in NXT. And then Vince buried a guy. And I think there's so much work that has to be done in order to sort of unbury a person, like dig him up, I guess, that I don't know that it's something they can afford to put the time and effort into. I mean, I, they could, but they've got obviously kind of like a limited amount of time and resources they can devote to that. And unfortunately, Shinsuke just ends up where he's at with Okada, you'd have like a clean slate. So maybe they would put a lot more effort into that. You got to figure that'd probably be the case, but I don't know, man. Only, you know, the, the fucking watcher knows, man, because they, the, they didn't happen. So there's no real way to tell if it was me, if I had, if I had Braun Breaker and Ilya Dragunov or Okada and Osprey, it's like, Hey, you got, you got to choose one of these, one of these duos here, one of these pairs here. Shout out to all the pair. Uh, what would you go with? I'll be I'd probably go with Okada Osprey. I really would. Elemental Giant says there isn't that big of a difference between early AEW and the product now, besides the fact that WWE has gotten better. Hard disagree on this one. I think back when Dynamite was only two hours, I'm sorry, back when AEW was only two hours a week and there was only a Dynamite, uh, I think it was vastly better. I think if you go back and look at a lot of Dynamites from back then, they had more focus uh, they seem to be telling stories in a more interesting way. MJF still felt fresh and didn't feel like he's just retreading the same shit kind of over and over again. Uh, yeah, the Hangman Page story. Hell, even if you want to extend it a little bit, like a couple of years into the, like the 2021 when CM Punk showed, I thought CM Punk's run was really, really good until until it didn't. Uh, but yeah, I don't know, man. I kind of feel like uh, the early AW was. In, in a vacuum, in a, you know, just in the AEW world, I think it was a lot better than than what we're getting now, oftentimes now. It seems like they just sort of like, I'm sorry, but when AEW started, it seems like there was a lot of ideas. It's like, let's try a lot of different stuff, and a lot of that stuff worked. But it's been five years. Things are going to change, and if you don't continue bringing that sort of inspiration on a week-to-week -week basis, especially now that you've added over double the amount of TV time that you now have to come up with creative for, you're just going to end up with collisions and rampages that just don't mean anything. Like not a lot of stuff happens on those shows except for wrestling. And a lot of you just really like the wrestling. I don't know that a lot of you is enough to grow AEW as a product. I think it's just sort of peaked in terms of how they're growing 
uh, their their audience base. I mean, what did All In do last year in terms of attendance? I think it was like 80,000, something like that. Like, I know that the joke was that nobody really knows, but it was in the vicinity of 80,000. And I think right now uh, it's at like 45,000, which is still a really good number. But if the next year you're only going to do 70% of what you were doing the year before in terms of your pay-per-view attendance for your biggest show of the year... Jay Ralstonism says, I feel I must preface this by saying they both did a lot for the WWE women's division. The women's division is currently more interesting now without Charlotte Flair or Becky Lynch. I never thought I'd be interested in Liv Morgan being a champion, but this story is fresh and really interesting. This is a really interesting take because I by and large agree with it. And it sort of offers up a potential problem, not a problem necessarily, but an interesting challenge, I would say, for Triple H and WWE. And it's sort of like, what do you do now when somebody has done everything there is to do? What interesting stories do you come up with after they have reached sort of peak relevancy and you've got all these other untapped stories slash characters out there that their stories haven't been told yet? And it's actually something that goes back a long way, and it's not just the women. For example, John Cena. That dude had sort of done everything he could possibly do, I don't know, by like, what, 2011, I would say? Because I feel like the punk Cena stuff was pretty interesting. Then they went into the Cena rock stuff for a couple years or it was that vice versa. That's vice versa. It was, yeah, what, 2011? And the thing was 2012 and 2013. So, yeah. And then after that, after that, when Cena had done everything there is to do, including beating The Rock in the main event of WrestleMania, if you look at where John Cena was between 2013 and, I don't know, like now or whatever, with the exception maybe of his United States Open Challenge, where he was doing stuff like, you know, uh, being killed by Kevin Owens in his debut. The interesting Cena stuff was really few and far between. What do you do with somebody who's done everything? Becky Lynch, by the end of her run, although I kind of appreciated her NXT title run, had sort of done everything. So then you just end up with, okay... Now we're going to use her to get other people over. Well, that's not terribly interesting. You got to learn to come up with stories for people who have done everything. Randy Orton's a great example of this. Is he right now doing something interesting? He's fight feuding with the bloodline. He's going to be in this six man. But it's not like anything Randy is doing is all that vital. Right? Like maybe if he was around more during peak Roman bloodline stuff, maybe we would have gotten an interesting feud with him and Roman. I think that's a possibility because Roman was the super relevant thing. And it's going to be interesting to see where they go with Roman from here on out because he's done the big interesting thing already. And where do you go from there? Same could be said, to be honest with you, for Cody Rhodes. The guy finished his story. He's now face of WWE. Are there other interesting stories for him out there? I think this bloodline stuff has more juice to it because they're introducing a different element of the bloodline. What happens when the bloodline goes bad and not bad, bad, not like they were weren't bad before because they were, but now they're just bad, bad, you know, at least before they, they were, they, they had goals. They were a family. Right. And we're exploring family dynamics. Now they're a family, but they're all just simply unlikable assholes. Right. Jacob Batu is really cool. Don't get me wrong. And Girls of Destiny are really cool. Don't get me wrong. But they're just like vicious. Right. There's no there's no like, you know, morals behind what they're doing. They're just out for blood. And now you're going to have the good bloodline taking on the bad bloodline and maybe we'll throw the rock back in there. So. But you guys understand what I'm saying, right? Like once a character has sort of done everything, well, that kind of by its nature means there's nothing left to do. So you got to come up with stories for these characters. And it's not just relegated to the women. 
it's been a thing with the men as well. What happens when you've just done everything? So uh, I don't know. It'll be interesting to see what's going on, but I think that's the case. And I, you got to wonder if Becky Lynch and Charlotte are sitting there thinking, man, oh man, uh, I wish that we were peaking when Triple H was in charge because then we can get some of these really awesome moments and grill. You know, granted, they main evented WrestleMania. That's awesome. But you got to think, that some of these wrestlers who have already kind of done everything under Vince are now thinking, God damn, I wish I was around. I wish I was peaking while Triple H was in charge because then they could be getting some, I could be in the middle of some really, really awesome storylines right now. Uh, not just subject to Vince McMahon's weird whims. So Tony, the Pokemon guy says the forbidden door concept slash idea has lost its luster in all companies in general. It seems like the forbidden door isn't really all that forbidden anymore. The let's be honest. Let's be completely clear. The only forbidden door really out there is when is WWE and AEW. to a degree. I think there's a smaller forbidden door with WWE and new Japan. But AEW sort of usurped New Japan's juice, so to speak, since their inception. And so now the forbidden, the real forbidden door is WWE AEW. That's really what it is. And if AEW continues upon its trajectory, even that's going to be a bit on the underwhelming side. It's not exactly WCW, WWF anymore, right? So, yeah, I don't know. I still think it's cool. I still think that there's some cool stuff to mine from the TNA WWE stuff, mainly just seeing Joe Hendry say his name. Uh, but yeah, I, 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 you know, AEW shown, hey, as long as you guys are cool working on our terms, uh, we're good with anybody in the Forbidden Door stuff. And so it does make it a little less ooh, taboo, a little less special. Um, but, uh, yeah, WWE, AEW, I think is still kind of an intriguing thing. I don't think it's ever going to happen, but still kind of feel like it's an intriguing situation. Art Fracture says Queen Zelina's British accent was hot. All right, man, look, you can be horny. That's cool. Just don't do it around these parts. Brooklyn Architect 210 says WrestleMania 9 main event shenanigans were still better than the main event of Mania 11. All right. So there's one thing in wrestling that you should not do, and that's bore people. And I'm not going to necessarily say the Mania 11 main event was boring because I think LT did like a decent job, but it was also not the most compelling thing in the world. Nobody ever talks about that beyond just saying, hey, LT did a pretty decent job. Nobody ever talks about that, though. And they really don't talk about the Shawn Michaels diesel stuff either of that era. Of course, everybody always talks about the Iron Man match between Brett and Shawn. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, WrestleMania 9, incredibly memorable. And it's wrestling. So it's like... It was just hilariously bad writing. The crowd super popped for it, and it was a very memorable moment, so they got that going for it. No, nobody ever talks about the Bam Bam LT stuff. Eastside Reviews says, if Okada was being booked in WWE the way he's currently being booked in AEW, people would lose their minds and be talking all sorts of crap about WWE and AAA. That is true, because context is everything. I do think that it works in AEW specifically because it's AEW, and it's he's in that situation. And AEW has sort of been given the benefit of the doubt, I think properly so, with good reason, that regardless of what he's doing as a character, and I think it's entertaining, the matches themselves are going to be really, really good. So it's not like they're just wasting him on a character that likes to say bitch. I think his comedy stuff with the elites actually really entertaining. It wouldn't make any sense if it was in WWE. So in that respect, you're right. People be like, what the fuck? What are you? Why? Why is he this character? In the elite, it makes sense, though. He's got a pre-existing relationship. We know what, like, in AEW, like, it's baked into it. You know what's going on or has happened in New Japan. You get that. So we've seen that Rainmaker before. Now this is a different Rainmaker. It's like AEW's canon kind of extends before they were even around. WWE, it's all, like, their universe. And, yes, they refer to other stuff that's happened, especially now. And if they brought him in, I have no doubt that they would have, like, referenced his New Japan legacy. But... It just would have been weird because there's no context there. There's nobody there that would make sense for him to be acting in that way. So, yeah, Triple H would be, you know, people would be giving him shit. But I don't think AEW gets a pass on Okada simply because it's not WWE. They get a pass because kind of makes sense. Like, we've seen aspects of this Okada before in New Japan. It's not like this heel turn for him isn't super like out of pocket. If he showed up in WWE, it would just be weird. 
Um, but it makes sense for AEW. Atticus8659 says, I have no desire to see Jey Uso get involved in this bloodline civil war. I love what he's doing on his own on Raw. I'm afraid if he reunites with Roman and Jimmy, he'll go back to being a tag team wrestler. I want to be a top single star. He is a top single star. It'll be really interesting to see. Number one, I, I really do want to see him get involved in the bloodline. But I also want him to like be able to step aside and be like, hey, Oos, I really like this solo run and I'm going to keep going at it. Uh, and then eventually we'll get like a, you know, a reunion, a proper reunion where they go back to being a tag team. But I think you got to think WWE's really happy with this solo run because he's like the most popular person on the roster as a solo guy. Walla Bois says Damian Sandow losing his cash in was one of the biggest bag fumbles of the last decade. Not sure how he'd fit into the current lineup, but he was one of the only standouts in the mid 2010s. Yeah, the mid 2010s kind of sucked until the NXT kids started coming up to main roster. But otherwise, the people that were just straight up on main roster, like 2010, the, the mid 2010s, the early 2010s, I'd say. Just not good at all. Damien Sandow, I thought he was great. I thought he was like one of those guys who really had a character that thrived in the WWE thing. And then once he left WWE, it's like, ah, uh, it didn't really work. But in WWE, I, I thought Damien Sandow was a terrific character. I thought he was like a perfect pro wrestling character. It's just Vince McMahon seemed to want to humiliate the guy instead. Anyways, that's going to do it for this Hot Takes. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. I appreciate it. Hit that subscribe, the notify bell, and the like. Till next time, we'll see you guys around.